Hello everyone, my name is Rob and I'm a postdoctoral scientist based in Vienna, Austria. In this video, I interview Withings about the ScanWatch, which is their flagship watch. I ask them questions about heart rate variability, heart rate and SpO2. Uh, so my name is Maxime Dumont and I'm product manager for ScanWatch and, and more generally for all the watches that we do at Withings. My name is uh, Romain Kazanvat and I worked in the applied research team. We look at the, at the sensor part of the, of the product. So I'm Paul Edouard. I'm a data scientist at, at Footing, part of the, the machine learning team. I should mention that they are all part of much bigger teams consisting of dozens of people. So many more people contributed to the development of the products and the algorithms. As always, I don't want to waste your time. So timestamps are in the description below and also on the timeline. I was wondering, could you explain what are your standardized tests for the heart rate monitor? Do you get people to run or is it like some device that you use? For HR, there is no, uh, there's no medical certification, but we do internal uh, measurement campaigns where we maybe on 20 or 30 people uh, will do a campaign where they, they go through several activities, including uh, running, climbing stairs, just lying, doing nothing, typing on the keyboard. And on all those activities, uh, we'll measure the heart rate with uh, ScanWatch, but also with a reference method, which is uh, using an ECG belt. And we'll compare the two. And uh, to optimize the algorithm, we'll look at you know, for how much percentage of the activity we are in a 5% range, for instance. And how did you choose which ECG belt to use? The polar one we use, uh, it's, uh, it's just very easy to, to get an accurate heart rate uh, signal from their, their API. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the same one I use, the Polar H10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very nice device. You also mentioned heart rate variability. Is that something that the watch can detect or not? We, we have a re relatively good heartbeat signal uh, that we can provide from the scan watch, and, and, and thus we can compute uh, out of the uh, metrics. We just don't see for now how, how to translate that to the future. That's something we, we can do for, we, we could do for a long time on, on, on the supernalyzer too. We, we have a, a, a features that we measure quite accurately. Well, generally, uh, uh, and, uh, at Withings, we, we don't really want to communicate about stuff that we have nothing to say about. It, it's said very grossly, but, but, but you get the point. I mean, if we don't actually detect anything and with certainty, we. And if, if we don't have uh, anything very interesting uh, to, to say uh, and also to follow uh, with the watch, uh, we, don't, we don't really get the, the point of just displaying it yeah. without any explanation. We have to make sure that we do it for a, a certain purpose and that yeah. we all agree uh, on it. If I, if I may add something, <laughs> we added the heart rate. It's simply the average uh, rate you are going to see. Mm. Actually, we have a lot of things to do to say about the heart rate. There's very strong correlations uh, between the overall health and this metric. Uh, you can monitor over time how it evolved. One of the issues we have with uh, the heart rate variability, we put it a bit redundant with the heart rate. Uh, physiologically, heart rate and heart rate variability are, um, are coordinated by the same systems. And so, uh, Usually when your heart rate increases, your heart rate variability decreases. For, so a lot of people use resting heart rate, which I guess is very similar to average sleeping heart rate. And you're saying when you get a better resting heart rate, so a lower resting heart rate over time, likely also your heart rate variability will increase. Exactly. There are some, some subtleties, but, but roughly that's what it is. So in a way, um, the sleep heart rate feature is our heart rate variability feature. It's and people can use it by saying, if I start, if I feel unhealthy or I have a, a relatively high resting or sleep heart rate, I will start training and I can see that decrease over time, which is an indication that my body is more healthy. As a personal experience, I monitor my, my sleep heart rate quite, quite closely. And during lockdowns, I've seen my sleep heart rate go, go up uh, over time, like uh, plus 5 BPM in average um, in a couple of months. So this has uh, uh, triggered me to start uh, running. And I, I've seen my sleep heart rate go back to uh, normal levels. There's also this automatic detection of activities. So regarding that, I have two questions. How does it detect it? And if it detects it, like if it detects cycling, is it something that happens in retrospect? So after it's done, or does it happen in that moment? And then also it starts to measure my heart rate more often. The, the idea is to, every minute, compute the features that are relevant uh, regarding uh, activity recognition. 
So if I stand the number of steps, uh, the intensity of the accelerometer signal, uh, zero crossing rate of the accelerometer signal, these are stored and, and um, compressed and sent to the app and then to the server. It's the app that runs uh, the accurate uh, recognition uh, models and then uh, tags a, a, a portion of time as an activity uh, of um, uh, running, walking, Cycling, I think that the, the, that's the basic ones. We do now start automatic workouts when you start running because running is very easy to, to recognize. There's like uh, tennis, badminton, football, fitness, etc., which are um, more complex to recognize. Mm -hmm. These ones are, are not done in the um, in the watch at all. Uh, what we do is, when someone uh, tags an activity as uh, as being tennis, for instance, we create um, a model uh, of this user specified for this user, which is uh, dis uh, designed to recognize the tennis played by this user, you know. So next yeah, time yeah. activity, we, we take um, uh, these features, we run them through your personal model of tennis, uh, and we, we try to see if it fits or not, if you are doing tennis or something else. So if I would give my watch to a friend of mine, uh, then it would not work as well for him or her as it would for me. Exactly. This is, yeah, there's reinforcement learning on, on, on the activities. And is that also true for, for other things like uh, sleep detection or heart rate? Is that, is that, does that also get tailored to the user or is there a general algorithm for that? Actually, activity recognition is the only instance in which we, we have uh, personalized uh, models. And for the SpO2 measurements in the original uh, instructions I, I saw, they told you you could either put your hand on it or not, but it's, is it better to press it, press it down a bit more or should it not matter too much? And the really important thing is that there is good contact between the sensor and the skin. That's really what we want. Uh, so it's good if the sensor is, is very flush with the skin, but is a bit pressing on the skin. So you can do that. Not everyone has to press the watch with the, with the hand. You can, like, you can manage good measurements if you tighten your watch correctly without doing that. But we found uh, during internal studies that it's just easier to tell everyone to press, uh, to press the watch with your hand because it enables, like it allows to have everyone putting kind of the same pressure and to have yeah, more, yeah. You know, better measurements for everyone. But it's not necessary. Like you, you may be able personally to tighten your watch correctly, like very well and not have to press the watch with your hands. So normally when you measure your SpO2, you have to keep your arms still, make sure that your muscles are relaxed. During the night, is it easy enough to record an accurate value of the actual SpO2 value or is, are there complications when getting absolute values for each moment of the night? Would it technically be possible for each 10 minutes to get an average SpO2 or would there be something that would prevent that? The, 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 there is more variability uh, on, the, on the quality of the measurement we get during the night uh, compared to what we get on a, on a, on a controlled environment where, with your arm uh, resting and, and um, the, the, the free hand on top of the watch. This is a very controlled environment and, and we usually get good uh, measurement this way. During the night, sometimes you get very, very good uh, signals and sometimes not so much. Uh, maybe because the, um, the arm is in such a position that maybe the, the contact between the watch and the skin is in, imperfect. There are, there are many things that, that can happen uh, which could prevent an accurate measurement. Our algorithm is capable of, of uh, knowing, uh, for instance, that um, the signal is not good enough and we, we cannot get an, an SPO2 at this time. I think to answer your question, we, 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 what we can do uh, quite well is at several uh, moments of the night, uh, be confident in our estimation and provide a SPO2 uh, value. We won't get necessarily on every one, every 10 minutes, an accurate measurement. For some of the measures that you use, like sleep apnea detection, you already use SpO2, right? Or not? Like SpO2 is already used by some algorithms to detect these things. Yes and no. The important factor when you look at SpO2 uh, to, to, to assess sleep apnea syndrome or, or vision disorders uh, is uh, the variation of, of SpO2. So you do not actually need to be accurate on your SpO2 uh, prediction. What you need is to uh, accurately depict the, uh, the short-term uh, variations. Uh, plus three percent, minus three percent. Yes and no. Like we, the algorithm, the SPO2 algorithm runs during the night, but this doesn't necessarily mean that we are confident in uh, in, in displaying a, a value to to the, to the user. Uh, I saw that you had to do several uh, clinical trials in order to get the medical parts of the the scan watch uh, approved, at least in Europe already. 
what were these trials exactly? Like, can you give us a bit of details about what you tested and how many people, what the outcomes were and what it means basically? Uh, for the, the SPO2 clinical trial, this is something that is defined precisely by a standard, an ISO standard. So you have to go through a hypoxia study, which is a study where you take healthy people and you have them go through some uh, desaturation, meaning you will have them breathe a certain uh, mix of oxygen, nitrogen, to lower their SpO2, like below 95%, but down to 70%. So this is a very standard study. And while you do that, you measure the SpO2 with your own device. So in our case, the scan watch and with a reference device, which is a hemoximeter. A hemoximeter is the standard method where you actually take a blood sample and measure the, all the blood gases, uh, including so oxygen. And so when you do that, you compare the SpO2 that you have on both devices and you compute an accuracy, an average accuracy over, mm -hmm. in our case, 40, uh, 14 people. Uh, so there's a minimum of 10 people for this kind of study, and we did 14. We got from that trial a 3% accuracy, which meets uh, the ISO requirement, which is to have at least a 4% accuracy. And in the case of the FDA guidelines related to the pulse oximeters, uh, the threshold is 3.5%, but we also meet uh, that target. So we should be good for FDA certification. So what does 3% accuracy mean in this case? Like 3% difference, or what does the 3% mean? It's a, so it's a 3% RMSE, so root mean square error. So the lower, the better. Yeah, yeah. The lower, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really like a square error that you could not you know, compensate uh, negative errors by uh, positive errors. How sensitive would you say the SpO2 sensor is? In ideal conditions, uh, I, I think we, we, can, we can assume that the, the accuracy of a watch is quite similar to what we have in, in our clinical study, uh, which is 3% uh, of RMSE, root mean squared error. Uh, then two thirds of the, the measurements are within plus or minus three percent. So if you get um, uh, 98, two thirds of uh, chance that it's between uh, 95 and, and 100. Usually, finger oximeters are uh, around 1.5 to 2 percent RMSE, and we, we hope to, to, to reach this level. So, about the SpO2 measurements, how well does it work for in different situations or for different people? I can imagine, for instance, tattoos, uh, it might be tricky, or people with a slightly darker skin tone. Like that's in tech a general problem. A lot of tech is developed for white men. I guess that like those are the people who are working in this. That's who are testing it. Have you tested how well this works either with having tattoos or having a different ethnicity, which means you might have a different skin tone. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so indeed a lot of things can, uh, can have an influence on the measurement. So tattoos could. It's better not to have a tattoo and the measurement location, that's for sure. If you move during the measurement, that's a, that's a no-go. And then some people have low blood perfusion. For some of them, it's a disease. Uh, it's called the Renault disease. For some people, it's just that they have low blood perfusion and it's harder to make a good measurement on them. But uh, you can usually uh, do a little better by rubbing your skin uh, around the sensor to make it a bit better perfused by blood. For the question on uh, darker skin tones, in our calibration and validation clinical studies, we included people with uh, darker skin, uh, medium dark skin, uh, and people with light skin. And that's mm -hmm. actually a requirement if you want to uh, validate an oximeter for the FDA. So we included that in our studies. So it is true that sometimes it's harder for people with a darker skin uh, to, to get a measurement, but that's our calibration includes. But in the study, you didn't find a difference in the accuracy or sensitivity between skin tones, or there was a slight tendency? Or So it's a study on 14 people, uh, which means that each subgroup, like each skin tone subgroup is going to be two or three people. So it's very hard to get meaningful information for, from that. Mm -hmm. Actually, in our study, the, the dark skin tones were not the ones with the uh, worst accuracy. Uh, it had actually a, uh, a worse accuracy on the medium skin tones than on the light ones and the dark ones, which just okay. means statistically it's maybe not and, and, very and, relevant. And then the sensor performed better on, yeah. on women. But that was, as I said, it's not very statistically relevant yeah. just because of the, you know, of the low number of people in the study. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
what is the main reason to test your SpO2? I would would be my question. There are, there are other uh, pathologies for, for which you, you might want to, to, to check your SPA2 um, uh, manually. Uh, COPD, which uh, can, can cause a lowered um, uh, SPA2 values uh, during the day. COVID, COVID. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> we are, there are, there are um, uh, reports of, of uh, people with very low uh, oxygen saturations, uh, around the 80%, and who didn't uh, really feel uh, particularly ill. Um, so in these cases, it would be very insightful to, to, to get your SPA2 measurements uh, and see that something is not right. If I may uh, um, take a, a personal example, I have friends that have the, the, the watch. There's one friend, for example, uh, just yesterday, he had a, a low oxygen saturation uh, on, on the scan watch. And uh, he, he had some uh, slight symptoms of, of uh, a pathology, or like he had uh, trouble breathing. And, uh, and he went to see his doctor and actually he had an uh, angina. He was able to, to spot a sign of something and then go to mm -hmm. the doctor. And, and the doctor said, yes, obviously you have something, not because of the watch, but by uh, taking a look at the symptoms and, and stuff, he confirmed that he had something. But the sign came from the, the scan watch. So, SpO2 is like a help to monitor your health in, in general and especially on breathing troubles. I found the interview to be really interesting and it helped me understand the watch and the design decisions a lot better. Now, as somebody who loves analyzing data, I personally would like to have access to more of the data that is recorded, for instance, the heart rate variability data, but I understand the decision of Withings not to show this. So again, thank you to the Withings team for donating their time to do this interview. Just to be clear, I was not sponsored in any way by Withings to make these videos. This interview is the third in a series of five videos I made about the interview I did with Withings. The first video is about the updates the watch would get. The second is about sleep and sleep apnea. This video is about SpO2 heart rate variability and heart rate. The next video will be about ECG and PPG and how they are used for AFib detection. And the final video will be a short video on the Withings Sleep Analyzer. In my videos, I do scientific tests on different devices like the Aura Ring, the Fitbit and the ScanWatch. And in the end, I hope to use tracking to improve my life. So if you like that subject and like this video, consider subscribing to my channel and also consider giving it a thumbs up because it makes it easier for other people to find my videos. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next video.